We have uh, just begun to work on our uh, steampunk game for uh, alternate reality down in uh, Katy, Texas, which is basically Houston. They have supplied us with this uh, this old sewing machine treadle and uh, challenged us to make something out of it that that uh. is. It is real. Yeah, they, they gave us a bunch of uh, a bunch of components that we are uh, using. Originally, they just had this as basically the base of a table, but it's got it's got this thing, and that's really cool and period period appropriate. So we are definitely going to turn this into something even cooler. Apparent function is a major part of, of steampunk. Uh, it's all the H.G. Uh, uh, Wells, Jules Verne, big machines that do impossible things. And, um, well, steam power. And with steam power, gears and, uh, well, pistons and wheels and stuff like this. So on this guy, uh, we've actually already uh, dry belt. I spent a lot of time looking for the drive belt for this guy looking at various V-belts and whatnot, and it turns out they still just sell the uh, leather bands that, uh, that originally drove this when it was a sewing machine. You can adjust the length on your own, and the leather is kind of just the perfect amount of stretchy, and it's working really well. Um, this wheel will, let's get going, drive this guy up top, still in frame though, up top there. Um, this is a solid piece. It is uh, brass and copper and it's burly and it's thick and it's heavy. Uh, you're going to be handling this and you're going to know that it's, it's real metal. And that's uh, a lot of the, the immersiveness and the, the use of materials for, for steampunk is wood, brass, copper, uh, pipes. And let, me, uh, let me say this. This thing is a, is a copper core brass bread sandwich. And uh, the reason it's done that way is because it's pretty. And a lot of uh, a lot of Victorian design was just there were there were just decorative uh, there was a decorative element to it. Um, so this is done that way. It's uh, the little lightning holes are there to let you see more copper on the inside. And it's a it's a big chunk of metal. And it's not a it's not a piece of painted plastic. And it's not a, a gear glued to something. It's real. Um, similarly, we've got uh, we made some fuses that'll be getting used for stuff. Uh, this is all real copper and um, inside. Uh, we use polycarbonate, polycarbonate on these guys because uh, acrylic will break. And um, we know this because we've done it. And oh, they will be using... Yeah, speaking of Gorilla Proof, won't break. Uh, and lot, lots of uh, copper pipe fittings. We'll be using these and all kinds of weird and wacky configurations that uh, don't make a lot of practical sense for plumbing. But whatever the weird steam, steampunk machine is doing, it obviously needs these weird bends in it and uh, lots of pipes conducting steam to various places. Let's build some crap. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, build and finish this deck, and then we'll build a housing to actually house all the mechanical stuff that's going to go inside it. So there will be a real machine powering real stuff. Matt will tell you what that's going to be. And uh, we'll be back in a moment after these words from our sponsors. Somebody sponsor us. That'd be cool. <laughs> We often have clients come to us and use the phrase, and I quote from many clients, it needs to look expensive. Well, you know what looks expensive? Expensive stuff. Because cheap stuff that's made to look expensive, uh, this is where you get like you know, all your, your melamine, uh, your fake wood veneers. Um, they're made to look expensive because it's supposed to look like wood, but you can, if you look close enough, or you kind of you can probably tell just looking at like, this is fake wood and it looks cheap. So. One of the, the very key ways to make something look like it is made of wood is to uh, kind of show the craftsmanship. This is kind of the uh, Gustav Stickley. Google him. He's really cool. Uh, the arts and crafts movement of the early 20th century, uh, where you can you see all your joinery and you can you can it's it looks really good. This isn't quite a we're, you have a dovetail jig here. We are just doing the uh, box joint with it, which is kind of the simpler version uh, for expedience. <sighs> You may have noticed that we have the instructions out for the, the uh, dovetail jig. That's because 
We don't use this thing terribly often. Uh, technically, we should have done the dovetails or the, the, the box joints uh, first and then cut it down to uh, width based on where, those, uh, where these joints actually landed. But uh, doing it this way was actually a bit of an afterthought. So um, we, uh, we ripped our, uh, down to th our piece down to three inches first. Uh, and then was like, hey, we should, we should make this cooler. So uh, we did. It's like three quarter ass, not quite half, not quite full, but uh, somewhere in there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to show you an insert shot of this. This stuff is, uh, this is quarter sawn oak. It's about a million times more expensive than regular oak, or what you would buy at a hardware store or whatever. Um, generally, you have to get this at a specialty store. It is a special, inefficient way to cut logs, to make wood out of it, to make uh, uh, boards out of it. But in doing so, um, it exposes this, uh, this checking, this tiger uh, stripe. Uh, effect, which you'll see in the insert shot. I don't know if you can see it here. The same technique and effect makes fiddleback maple fiddleback maple. And if you look at the back of a violin, that really cool uh, book matched quilting, um, that is, uh, that's the same effect. Uh, we're just getting it out of oak instead of maple, so it's not quite so smooth and glossy. But it's actually like an iridescent effect. Um, and it was really common back in the Victorian era. It's a decorative wood. And again, it was expensive back then. Our, uh, our super throne uh, chair that we have in the back is, a, is actually a steampunk bishop's throne. Um, and, uh, and that has some fantastic quarter sawn oak on it. To build that chair nowadays would be thousands of dollars. I'm gonna revisit something that I, that I talked about in the Christmas tree video. And that is how to get really, really professional results in your furniture refinishing product pro project or stain and stuff. The thing is, is that most people when they finish furniture, like I'm talking about amateur homeowner guy, DIY guy, goes to his local home improvement store and he gets a can of this stuff or something very similar to this. This is stain. Now this one is natural and this stuff we do use. The stuff that has color in it though, we try and stay away from. Or we'll just use, we'll, we'll use, mix a, a tiny bit of a colored stain with natural and make a very low tone variety and what you do what this is good for is for bringing out grain and that's what they tell you it's for the problem is is that the pigment that's in it is giant they're giant particles of pigment and they look terrible on it if you you can always spot something that was finished with this stuff and some polyurethane it looks like an amateur did it it does not look professional because that's not how professionals do it what professionals do and this stuff is cheap and once you realize this, it's like, I can make my own stain, or actually not stain, we're gonna make toner. Uh, so what toner is, is it's lacquer, and, uh, and we mix lacquer, and you can actually do this yourself if you're gonna brush it. You can make it yourself using a uh, brushing sanding sealer that is, um, that is lacquer based. And you can get that at, at your local home improvement store. And this stuff is, Every, every town has a paint store that you can get this stuff from. This is made by Mohawk. There are other varieties. I've never used any other ones because these are great. Um, but this is uh, an alcohol-based wiping stain. We don't use this as stain. Uh, we have, we did it on the Christmas tree, but, uh, but we use this to make toner. Now what toner is, is it's a clear coat that has color in it. It's the, uh, it's the same thing as doing a candy color on a car. So your, your car starts, starts out silver and you put a clear red coat over that silver so you see the metallic shine through. It's the same thing we did on the reactor cores and a bunch of other stuff. But if you really want something to make, make it look like it was a, a professionally built piece of furniture, professionally finished and, and just the whole nine yards fantastic, this is the way to go. And we're gonna show you how to do that. I'll give you a quick recipe and rundown. By the way, and, and this is gonna go long, but uh, this stuff is, uh, you can get this in uh, like light maple or medium maple or dark walnut or medium walnut, but it also comes in color colors like green or yellow, or this one I think is raw umber. This one is raw umber. Um, so these are artist colors. And so uh, you can think about it just from a, a primary color wheel standpoint, red, 
yellow, green, brown, and then various shades of all those things. Um, so we can mix our own and stuff. Okay, this is an HPLV gun. Uh, these are available from Harbor Freight if you want to. Uh, this one's a little bit better than that, but uh, there, there are not giant differences in, in, a, in a great many grades of them. You can get them for cheap, you can get them for expensive, and they're, there's not that much difference until you get to pretty expensive. Um, so I've already added about three quarters of an ounce of, and I'm doing a small project, so it's, I'm not making a full can of this. Um, I've added about three quarters of an ounce of lacquer thinner to this. And uh, just, oh, by the way, Mohawk makes aerosol can toner if you're doing something really small. Once you get over about, um, about eight inches by eight inches, I wouldn't use one of these because you're gonna start to see the irregularities inherent in an aerosol can. Uh, but for a small project, these things are great. This is uh, just a tiny splash of lacquer thinner. Uh, for anybody out there who's using the metric system, that was probably about eight milliliters of each, retarder and thinner. Uh, now we're gonna go with, um, with uh, a pre-catalyzed clear lacquer, uh, and we're gonna do uh, 250 mils of that, which is about a cup. Now, one thing that I will say is that, uh, is that I am making more than I need, but I'm also gonna be kind of eyeballing the color that I put into it. If I, if I didn't make enough and then I had to make a new batch, it's not gonna be exactly the same as what I made before. If I am gonna use a lot of it, then what I'll do is I'll pre-mix a large container of the color that I want, and that way I can just keep reloading the gun and I don't run out and I don't have to keep remixing, unless I forget and that's never happened. All right, so this is medium dark walnut. It's got some red notes and brown notes in it. Uh, I'm just gonna, and there is a, you are very limited to how much of this stuff you can add before it, uh, it, you start making the lacquer fail. So uh, I think your maximum is about 10%. Uh, this is raw umber. This is a pure brown note. Sorry. So you can start to see that's a really thick, or the thin part at the top is about what we're gonna get out of this. All right, so uh, I'm gonna put a mask on and we'll spray some stuff and make it really stinky in here, which is why I'm wearing a mask. All right, here's the part where I explain to you uh, the thing that you need to know, which is gonna really screw the people who, who clicked off before now. Um, so uh, toner, you need to spray toner lighter than you want it to be. Uh, because here's what happens, is that you, this is your surface of your material right here. You spray a layer of toner, and this is obviously magnified many times, and there are lots of pigment particles that are suspended within that space. Pretty cool. The thing is that you can see through those and in between all those particles. Um, when it dries, it ends up being much thinner because all the solvent has evaporated, but all those particles are now hyper dense within this space. I'm probably clicking or pinpointing off where I want it to be now. But anyway, uh, what ends up happening is it gets a lot darker as it dries, or you want to at least spray probably about half as dark as you want it to be, and then, and then let it uh, become darker as it cooks off. And then if you need to spray another coat because you want to make it darker, well, then you can do that too. <laughs> we are now to the assembly phase of this machine. These still need to be secured down. These are the bearing standoffs. There's a bearing. So, belt comes up. Bearings go on. It's knotted in. All right. That is okay. I also need the uh, the EMT strap and the uh, 3M pad as the spacer. The 3M pad is um, it's got some nice squish to it. 
and uh, it's also just slightly abrasive, so it's going to keep the motor from wanting to walk around. This little guy right here, uh, this is a matrix of diodes that will uh, make sure that regardless of the direction that the wheel is turning, you're getting positive voltage on the end. Uh, this machine will actually be talking to a, an Arduino, so I'll be using an uh, uh, analog read pin that I'll be picking up the signal off of this one to determine what goes on in the, the next stage of the puzzle. And as it is, with the wheel spinning one way or spinning the other, going through the motor, that would cause either positive voltage or negative voltage, depending on which way you had the wires go, and we want it to be uh, universal. So we've got four little diodes here, and uh, the signal coming from the, the motor, will be coming from these white guys, here and here, going to this little corner of the diode matrix, and then this corner of the diode matrix. And depending on which way the, the flow is going, It'll be coming out, so you're always going to get positive voltage coming into your red, and the, uh, the negative of the ground side will be coming in the black. Uh, so bidirectional, and uh, we'll do the same voltage either way. Uh, one of the things we really like about this is that it feels like it should be there. It's a period correct piece, and uh, this mechanical motion to generate uh, electricity and uh, trigger the next level of the puzzle. I've seen similar stuff used in uh, some other games that I've played um, around the country. And what are you doing there? Okay, there we go. Um, there's one game in particular where they had a um, there's a little literal bicycle crank with bicycle pedals attached to the wall in a jail cell, and uh, it was a, the whole game was great. It was fun, but there's no reason you should have bicycle pedals mounted like head height in a jail cell. It just, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Um, whereas with our, our steampunk game here, we have a, a wonderful excuse to use this mechanical motion to uh, electrical signal, uh, and it, it, it works much more thematically. So I guess just because you can use a certain mechanic doesn't mean you should. Uh, you can save that for a, a more appropriate time. Um. And this is essentially ready to, uh, ready to roll. There is multimeter, and we're gonna get the pedal going. There we go, okay. Um, so this is a fairly comfortable pace that I'm going at, and uh, I'm putting out right about five volts. Okay, it's, uh, at this speed, I'm going between 4.75 and 5.2 volts. Um, and then to demonstrate wire diodes are in there. Get this reversing. And I'm still getting that same positive voltage. Uh, if I were coming straight off of the motor without going through our little diode matrix, see I've got positive voltage going this way, but negative voltage going that way. A couple ways we could do this. We're gonna end up going with a uh, Arduino. So this will be going into a uh, analog in pin on an Arduino. Uh, we'd played uh, with just using the voltage coming straight off of this to power some LEDs uh, that are going to be involved in, in the next stage of this puzzle, but you had to get it really, really cranking. Uh, this motor, depending on if you turn it fast enough, it'll do 12, 13, up to 15 volts uh, just fine, but you have to really get cranky, at which point uh, you're going to end up maybe damaging this because that's, at that point you're at about 1500 RPMs versus the roughly 500 RPMs of, of this. This is essentially a uh, final mock-up before we fasten down uh, all these pieces uh, for good. Uh, plates here are still loose and these uh, standoffs need to get uh, uh, hard attached. But, um, yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. All right, so look, there's a giant thing in front of you because of forced perspective. It's not really forced perspective, it's just perspective. It's actually that big. And um, the, uh, let's see, we're going to be doing a summary uh, uh, real soon, and uh, there's more of this steampunk stuff to come. So uh, We have begun to, fr begun to frame the device.
the device. The device is a multifaceted, multidimensional doohickey. Just as nefarious so, as it sounds. Yeah. So, see you real soon and stuff. This is where the place where the where the video tapers off because people are clicking off even though we haven't stopped talking. It's amazing how that happens. Oh, it's gonna be really graphic if he keeps all this in. Goodbye. See you next time. Wave to the people. Hello, people.